Transmission lines. We are going to learn way more about transmission lines in this video than you need to know for this class. The purpose of this is to explain what a transmission line is, but all the different things that we can do with them and what your analysis that you will create in this class will enable people to do and why it's important. So first, what is a transmission line? Well, a transmission line is essentially a cable that transports a high frequency signal. Now there are also power transmission lines, but here we're primarily talking about the high frequency lines. There's roughly two ways to categorize these. And so all the combinations of those two ways gives us four families of transmission lines. And that's what I'm showing here. So one way to characterize these is differential versus single ended. In a differential line, there's two perfectly symmetric wires, and you can think of a, one's a plus and one's a minus. And so we have a, a buried parallel plate, two little flat strips of wire, and they're you know, extending this way through the dielectric. There's also a shielded pair, two little wires embedded in a, a, a ground usually on the outside. There's slot lines. What I'm not really showing is these two hunks of metal actually continue off to the left and to the right. So it's a real thin slot between two strips of metal. But again, it's symmetric. There's a plus and a minus. Or maybe these things aren't so big, just two little side-by-side -side transmission lines. And that's a coplanar strip, also sometimes called a differential pair. So in these differential lines, there's really no difference between those lines. Maybe we call one a plus, one a minus. However, it's an AC signal. So what's plus and minus keeps swapping back and forth. Then we have the single ended signals. Here's where we have essentially just one signal line and then another big ground line. So a real common one is a coax. We have a signal line in the middle and then a big ground around the outside. Circuit boards also very often have a buried strip line. So we have our signal line that's buried between two large ground or power planes. And the most common line you'll see looking on a circuit board, you'll see just a wire going along the circuit board. There's a dielectric and a big, huge ground plane underneath. There's a coplanar line, which has a, a signal line and two big ground planes next to it, sometimes a ground plane underneath of it too. So all of these have a signal line and then big, huge ground lines around. They're not symmetric. Uh, sometimes these are called unbalanced lines and the differentials are called uh, balanced. We can also look at these in terms of homogeneous and inhomogeneous. In a homogeneous line, all of the dielectric around the line is the same thing. We don't see two. So a coax, everything around the signal line, everything the electric field and magnetic field would see is the same material. And that goes with the strip line, the buried parallel plate, and the shielded pair. Now in homogeneous, we might look at this microstrip and say, hey, I only see one dielectric. Well, actually there's air up here. And if you imagine the field lines that might start on this line, they extend into the air and then penetrate through the dielectric to the ground plane. So those field lines are penetrating two different dielectrics, air and the dielectric of the substrate. And we can say the same thing for all of these lines. And so each of these things, if we were to take a much more rigorous course on this, each of these would send us in a slightly different direction in how to analyze them. We have what are called the transmission line parameters, R, L, G, and C. And we can think of a transmission line as being composed of a whole bunch of little tiny circuit elements. And I'm showing what would be a little pair of lines and it's kind of fading out back and forth between all these little tiny circuit elements. Um, what we shouldn't think of, and we're going to treat these circuit elements as if they're little discrete elements, but actually it's distributed along the line. Right, if we look at this line, it's a big, huge wire, another big, huge wire running in parallel to it. That's one big distributed capacitor. Yet we're drawing little tiny discrete capacitors to represent that. There's resistance along the line. This isn't perfectly conducting. So we have this sort of series resistance that's distributed along the line. The dielectric between them might be partially conductive. And again, that's smooth and distributed along the line. So these transmission line parameters are distributed parameters. We might look at the resistance, but the units will actually be ohms per meter because it's a distributed parameter. Uh, 
Now, thinking of these things as discrete, uh, we can look at a little tiny section of this transmission line. And this distance, delta Z, has to be much, much smaller than a wavelength in order for the circuit analysis to be valid. So just imagine this being a, you know, one millionth the size of a wavelength. And what that does is that means that we can apply standard circuit theory where the voltage across a line is constant. Whereas if the wavelength were more on scale of this circuit, well, the voltage would actually vary across the line and we really could not apply conventional circuit theory. We can make this as small as we want to. In fact, uh, in another class where we would rigorously analyze this, we would perform circuit theory on this and then let delta Z go to zero. So think of it as very, very small. Voltage across the line can be constant. And we have, uh, let's go to the next slide and talk about them. So we have the, first of all, the resistance per unit length. And so this is really due to the resistance in the wires composing the line. And that's written as R. Now remember, we're writing this as a discrete circuit element, but that's really resistance per meter, ohms per meter. So in order to treat it as a discrete element, we actually have to multiply by this distance. That way we get just an ohms. And the same thing for all these parameters. We're multiplying by delta Z so that we can treat them as single elements. Now we have wires in a transmission line. Those wires have magnetic fields around them that store energy. And if we try to change the voltage or current in those lines, that inductance will you know, induce currents to try to oppose that, just everything we know about inductance. And so we have a series inductance or distributed inductance. We may have our lines separated by dielectric. Well, may, we will have lines separated by dielectric and there could be some conductance through that. And so we will have a distributed conductance. We also have two parallel lines. That's forming a capacitor. So we also have a distributed capacitance. One thing to keep in mind, yes, we have a resistance. Yes, we have a conductance. And yes, resistance is one divided by conductance. But this resistance is not this conductance one divided by that. These are two different things. They're representing different things. We put one in terms of conductance, but these are not the same parameter that we can calculate one from the other. They're very different. Um, this distributed resistance is the conductivity essentially of the wires. This conductance is the conductance through the dielectric that will be separating the wires. So don't think we can calculate G from R. Uh, two different things are happening here. A really important parameter that we're after is called the characteristic impedance. And if we look at any one point on the line and we could freeze time and we look at the voltage divided by the current, that gives us what's called the characteristic impedance of the line. Now, it's not so much that high impedance is good, low impedance is good. It's not so much that. It's when the impedance changes along the line that we cause reflections. We'll talk more about that. And so we tend to want to keep the impedance constant along a line to prevent reflections because we want all of the power from our source to get to our load. And actually, that's not even always true. And I'll show you some examples of where we want reflections. So if we perform our circuit analysis and skipping all that, we can derive an equation to calculate our characteristic impedance in terms of these RLGC parameters. And we see omega, that's our angular frequency. So it's two pi times the ordinary frequency. Now, very often we can ignore R and G. We're using copper or something, the resistance is very low. We're, we use a very good dielectric. And so the, the conductance is very low also. And we can ignore those. And that's usually pretty accurate to do and it reduces our equation for the characteristic impedance to just square root of L over C. And even though this is the equation that is true and accounts for loss in the line, this is how we tend to think when we're doing, you know, back of the envelope calculations. And also, if we have a good line and the line's small, this is super good to do. We, we tend to only use an account for loss when we have either a very bad line or a good line, but we're propagating a signal, you know, many kilometers across that where these losses, you know, accumulate and become much more serious. So for us, we're going to ignore the loss parameters in our analysis. And in fact, the analysis procedure we're developing won't be able to handle loss parameters. Uh, 
we would need, in fact, to do a much more rigorous analysis. And you can look ahead or di in different courses where we do waveguide analysis. And it's a slight modification to the waveguide analysis to analyze transmission lines. Transmission lines are waveguides. So just using that code, we can calculate our mode in the transmission line. It's just how you would post-process those fields to calculate the distributed parameters that changes a little bit. So for our analysis, it's much simpler than doing that. And we're just going to have distributed inductance, distributed capacitance, and we'll calculate characteristic impedance from that. And that will work 99% of the time. Just some examples. So we have a coax, twisted pair, and even a microstrip. And analyzing these, here are the distributed parameters and the characteristic impedance. Now, what I find fascinating is while the characteristic impedance can vary a little bit, look at the values of R, L, G, and C for all of these things. They are extremely similar. I find that interesting and strange. So our distributed resistance always seems to be I'll call it 100 milliohms per meter, and yeah, that can vary a bit, but you know, in the milliohm per meter kind of range, distributed inductance, a few hundred nanohenries per meter always seems to be right around there. And I think that's because all transmission lines are essentially composed of straight wires that have a similar distributed inductance. The conductance is on the order of, I'll call it five micro siemens per meter, the distributed capacitance, I'll say 75 picofarads per meter. And they all seem to be right around those same ranges. Very interesting. So just some examples of realistic parameters in realistic lines so you get a feel for this. So if your simulation produces something way off of this, something's probably wrong. So let's talk a bit more about why impedance is important. And as I mentioned, it's not such a big deal that we have a high impedance, low impedance. We don't care so much about that. It's when the impedance changes that we get reflection. So what I'm showing here is sort of a cartoon for if we go from one transmission line into another. And I'm not implying that this is what your transmission line has to look like. That's just my cartoon for the transmission line changing. So when the impedance changes, it turns out that's the fundamental thing that causes a reflection, and we can calculate the reflection. So it's impedance from the second line minus the impedance from the first line divided by the sum of the two impedances. And so it's that discontinuity and impedance that causes reflections, and that's usually bad because we usually want all of the power from the source to get to the load. Now we may want to do this on purpose. Maybe we're doing filtering or some other kind of thing where we want waves to start bouncing around, cancel each other and perform filtering functions. But normally we just want to keep impedance matched. When we do have reflections, we have our first wave that was traveling forward toward that reflection. And then we have a wave that reflects and travels backwards. So we have both a forward and a backward traveling wave. And something kind of interesting happens, we get what's called a standing wave. So just focus your attention on the top. This is the voltage on the line. On the bottom is the current, but it's going to tell the same message as the voltage. But the green curve here, that's the forward wave. Then it produces some reflection at the load, and then the gray line is showing the backward reflected wave. The next thing I did was add those two, and that's the solid blue line. Now, what's very interesting is that does not appear to be moving. It's just oscillating. So that's why we call it a standing wave. We are looking at the voltage at the top, so we are looking at a voltage standing wave. And these standing waves, we tend to get higher voltages than the original signal on the line. And this can cause problems. Uh, if we have suddenly higher voltages on our line, that can fry things, that can zap our transmission line. Or you know, we have this energy traveling back to our source. Our source may not be prepared to have energy back going into it. So all kinds of bad things can happen. And this dashed blue line shows the envelope that this line is oscillating in. And we tend to want to get a, a measure of how bad this standing wave is. So we've devised what's called the voltage standing wave ratio. And what we do is we figure out what's the maximum voltage on the line 
what's the minimum voltage on the line that we would see? And we divide the two, and that's called our voltage standing wave ratio. This is another weird phenomenon, and it's called impedance transformation. So if we're a source sitting right at the load, the load is the impedance that we see. However, as we back away from the load, or if we connect the load through a transmission line, as we change the length of the line, the impedance looking in changes, and it changes according to this equation. And I'm animating that up here. This is really weird. What's really weird is our load might be an open circuit. As we back away, at some point, the source thinks of driving a short circuit. Or if our load was a short circuit, at some point our load thinks it's driving an open circuit. And inductors can look like capacitors. Capacitors can look like inductors. And it gets really crazy. So this happens if there's a reflection. If the impedance of the line is matched to the impedance of the load, this doesn't happen. You can back away and you only ever see the impedance of the load. So another reason we really want to always keep impedances matched to prevent those reflections. I shouldn't say always because sometimes we want reflections when we're performing some kind of function like filtering. So this impedance transformation is really strange and you know this could get into what's called the Smith chart and other things and, and this is really cool. Impedance matching. We would definitely need this analysis tool to do an impedance matching. So let's say we have a transmission line and we want to hook it up to a load. Well, and then there's a reflection because the two don't match. Well, one thing we can do is we can insert another transmission line that has a different impedance than the original transmission line and the load. And we make it a quarter wavelength long. And if we do that, it turns out we will match our transmission line to the load and we prevent reflections. But how do we design that? Well, we have to know what is a quarter wavelength. And in order to determine the quarter wavelength, we have to analyze the line to get our transmission line parameters. So the code that you are going to write is going to let us do things like this and everything else we've been talking about. Now in this class, this is not an electromagnetic class or a microwave engineering class. We're just going to do the analysis. I just want you to see why that's needed, what people would use that for. Now here's where we want reflections. And we might take a transmission line, this is a microstrip line, and notice we're changing the thickness. And, or the width I should say, not thickness. Thickness would be the vertical direction, but we're changing the width. And so that changes the impedance of the line. And at these discontinuities, we get reflections. Now we have a bunch of discontinuities here. So a wave coming in, it would ref some of that would reflect from that first discontinuity. Most of it would keep going. Some would reflect from the second discontinuity. Some of that would keep going here. Some would reflect from that first, come back here. Anyway, we have millions of little tiny reflections all over the place here. And we get an overall filtering response from this. And it's possible to go in and design what these different impedances need to be in order to control your filter response, you know, Butterworth, Chebyshev, and, and low pass, high pass, all these things we can do by designing discontinuities. But at the end of the day, in order to do this, we have to design the transmission line to give us these impedances. That's where your analysis tool comes in. It lets us do that. So all of this is enabled by some tool that can analyze a transmission line and calculate its parameters and characteristic impedance. From the bottom of my heart, thank you very much for watching this video. I love hearing your stories about how these videos helped you. I also love answering your questions. So please tell me your stories and ask your questions in the comment section. I promise I will try to answer every single question that's asked. If you like this video, hit the like and subscribe button. I also recommend visiting the official course website that has links to the latest versions of the notes, the latest videos, and there's lots of other resources to help you learn, including implementations in MATLAB. I'll see you in the next video.